So I've been wanting to address one of the most pressing issues of our time, the genocide in Gaza. There's a lot of history I could rehash about the Nakba, the Balfour Declaration, the PLO, the Intifadas, and so on. But what I'd like to address instead is uh, something that's um, uh, something that's uh, involved in the occupation that, that has implications for us here in the U.S., settler colonialism. To understand settler colonialism, we first have to look at colonialism as such. Colonialism involves not only conquest, but the transformation of the conquered territory into a vassal for the colonial power. Subsistence economies are transformed into export economies, with farmers changing their fields from produce for local production, uh, for local consumption to cash crops to be sold abroad. Their economies are specialized to export resources to the Imperial core, while the Imperial core uses those resources to manufacture finished products that are sold back to them. Colonialism uh, uh, often means destroying domestic manufacturing in these ter territories, as the British did with India's garment industry. So long as the colonies are exporting the resources, they can't build up the kind of resilient economy that, uh, that can more readily provide for its own people. Jane Jacobs described how a local economy involves import substitution, in which something is imported at first until people learn how to make it themselves and they're able to export it elsewhere, while importing other goods that they, that they, that's, um, they in turn learn how to make and then export forming a kind of springboard of development down the line in, in which development begets development. Local economies diversify as they become more resilient, leading not to autarky, but relative autonomy in which it is surpluses that are traded, rather than trade being the basis of the economy. This process is precisely what is disrupted by colonialism. It involves what Andre Gunder Frank called the development of underdevelopment. It is when colonies are made dependent uh, so that they must compete with one another to undercut wages, sell off resources, and sabotage the development process in order to keep exporting to the imperial core. To achieve this, colonial powers first privatized the commons, disrupting the subsistence economies that existed before. They would impose hut taxes, a debt burden that people would have to work uh, for them and their business, business interests in order to pay off. They would appoint uh, administrators from the local population, creating a vassal class loyal to them rather than to their own people. And of course, they would use a military to put down any revolt that might challenge their power. The post-war period saw a time of decolonization in which several former colonies achieved independence. Many of the revolutionary leaders of these countries were educated in Europe, where they learned uh, European ideas about economics that promoted free markets and trade. These principles were not how Europe itself actually developed, but it was presented as received wisdom as to how any economy should actually develop. The Bretton Woods institutions founded toward the end of the Second World War were intended to establish a global uh, monetary management standards to regulate trade between nations and to promote development. Under this guise, the World Bank and International Monetary Fund loaned money to these former colonies to develop their economies. Uh, however, this development meant developing their export-based economies. When demand was good, uh, when demand for a good was disrupted, uh, or there were supply shocks, such such countries found themselves unable to pay back these loans. Furthermore, much of the money loaned to them uh, was actually given to Western corporations, with the West effectively using the nation's resources to pay its own elite. The Bretton Woods institutions uh, would implement structural adjustment programs, in which debt which debt relief was conditioned on privatizing resources and social services and loosening labor regulations to be more easily exploitable. When they wouldn't cooperate, the CIA would come in and uh, arm some, some insurgent group to overthrow them. As a last resort, there would uh, there would be a full-scale military invasion, as we saw in Iraq. In these ways, the global order is set up so that there's a, a core to which resources flow and a periphery from which resources are extracted. Now, this type of colonialism generally leaves the, po the local population more or less intact. If you go to, say, Kenya, uh, you might find some white people descended from the British occupiers, but most of the population is indigenous to the region, with a significant immigrant population as well. Settler colonialism is different in that it seeks to replace the local population with a settler population. This was the path taken here in the U.S., where white settlers pushed indigenous peoples off the land, slaughtering those that hadn't already been killed off by disease, and rounding up the survivors into reservations, where residential schools sought to uh, destroy their culture. The American Revolution was in part motivated by the British restricting settlement on the frontier. These white settlers felt entitled to all indigenous land, with any restriction on their plunder taken as a grievous impression that could not stand. Uh, the frontier was a symbol of freedom for people who had few prospects at home and sought to move west to make their, fo their fortune. It was America's manifest destiny to conquer the west from sea to shining sea, 
and the savages who, uh, they encountered along the way would have to be contained or eradicated. Canada remained with the Crown much longer, but pursued its own genocidal program, keeping its residential schools well, running well into the 80s. <clears throat> Settler colonies uh, were also established in, in Australia and New Zealand. Captain Cook's landing in 1788 is, is celebrated Australia Day, but the Ab Aboriginal people have always known it as Invasion Day. As for them, it, is, it began a, a long process of ethnic cleansing. Unlike in North America, the British didn't even bother making treaties with the Aboriginal peoples. They just stole their land outright. Uh, the systemic kidnapping of Aboriginal children, in which they were taken from the culture to have the savage educated out of them, continued well into the 20th century. They were not given full voting rights until 1977. Another settler colony was established in South Africa, as the Dutch East India, as, as the Dutch East India Company uh, established a Cape Colony. Uh, where a wave of settlers uh, known as Boers uh, settled the land and pushed native people off the land as they established farms and permanent settlements. The British in turn conquered this land starting the Boer Wars, in which there really were no good guys. North of the settlement, they established Rhodesia, named after Cecil Rhodes, the Prime Minister of Cape Colony, who made, who made this new colony his personal property. Rhodes was a paragon of British imperialism, conceived of the, of the Cape to Cairo Railway to unite Africa under British rule. He also helped establish the De Beers Corporation, whose diamond monopoly was deeply involved in the covert trafficking of, of conflict diamonds during Africa's bloody Congo Wars. One admirer of Rhodes was, the, was Theodore Herzl, the founder of Zionism, who wrote to him enthusiastically telling him that he was invited to make history by promoting co the colonization of Palestine. This invitation was later taken up by Lord Balfour at a time when the British were fighting the Ottoman Empire in the First World War and considering how to divide the spoils after defeating their enemy. It should be understood that at the time, Zionism was not the majority position among British Jews, who thought of themselves as loyal British and sought assimilation into society. They had made significant gains in British society over the course of the 19th century, even to the point of having a Jewish prime minister, Benjamin Disraeli. Zionists actually had to stoke anti-Semitic fears to portray Jews as fundamentally alien to British society, and requiring a homeland of their own. Waves of Jewish settlers came to Palestine over the next few decades, but it was after the Second World War, after waves uh, of Jewish re refugees fleeing the Holocaust had been turned away from multiple countries, that Zionism came to be seen as the answer to the atrocity they experienced. The British held Palestine until 1948, after a wave of Zionist terror attacks uh, led to the creation of the State of Israel. A mass ethnic cleansing called the Nakba saw dozens of massacres of Arabs and over 500 Arab-majority towns de depopulated. Since then, Israel has con continued to push Ar uh, Palestinian Arabs further and further to the margins, with illegal settlements given implicit support by Israeli hard hardliners. The current genocide is the latest in a long line of attacks on Palestinians, clearing them from the land to make way for more Israeli settlement. The American model of settler colonialism was particularly influential on the German aid Adolf Hitler. Hitler saw Germany as as having its own manifest destiny, which would be achieved for the policy of Lebensraum, or living space. His book Mein Kampf goes to great lengths to argue that the Earth's resources are inherently scarce, and that no improvements in agriculture can be create abundance for all. This was to make his case that there was an inherent struggle for resources and only the best could win. He opposed communism, capitalism, liberalism, and Christianity alike, all as Jewish lies, because they were universal ideologies that obscured the only real truth of the world, racial struggle. In pursuing this racial struggle, he sought to colonize Eastern Europe for Germany, particularly the breadbasket of Ukraine. The Jews who died in the Holocaust overwhelmingly came from Eastern Europe, and most did not die in the camps, but were shot by the Einsatzgruppen. Slavs, Poles, and Romani were likewise slaughtered on their march eastward, as they sought to clear the away land for German, settle for German settlement. They launched Arbor Operation Barbarossa, the largest and costliest land offensive in history, and only through the uh, their serious miscalculation of Soviet military capacity and willingness to fight that they finally lose and were forced to retreat. Fascism is deeply tied to settler colonialism, and can be partly understood as its apotheosis. Not only does it involve ethnic cleansing, but it inscribes a settler ethos in, one, in, in which one's own people have a common destiny to conquer and subdue the land. All modern colonialism has had a racial character, but settler colonialism in particular has a genocidal aspect built right into it and abuse settlers with the blood and soil nationalism by which they feel entitled to the land and will fight back violently against any attempts to curb that, to curb that entitlement, including by their colonial benefactor. 
the white rage we see in this country against any signs of racial progress is a continuation of this settler mentality. Settler colonialism has also been a major driver behind the ecological crisis. When white people settled the, the American frontier, they wiped out indigenous farming methods that worked with, with local ecology, replacing with the same system of cash crop monoculture that would later be imposed on the world through other colonial measures. Industrial agriculture has continued this process, using chemical fertilizers and pesticides in conjunction with genetically modified crops to try to extract as much fertility from the soil as possible, and leaving desertification and agricultural runoff in its wake. Forests that were tended for generations by indigenous people have been clear-cut, affecting rain patterns leading to flash floods and soil erosion. The indigenous people who had managed wildfires through controlled burns were hung as arsonists, and now we find ourselves facing out-of-control wildfire seasons as, as the climate heats up. The ecological crisis is fundamentally a crisis of colonialism. We see settler colonialism in a more subtle form in our own cities through gentrification. Areas that are cleared for... Uh, areas are cleared for the development so that a new crop of, of higher income residents can come in. Whole communities uh, that have made a life of these neighborhoods are treated as unwanted elements that are surveilled and policed as new shops, cafes, and, and restaurants open that, that cater to a different clientele. Broken windows policing is used to make arrests, and as rents soar, most are displaced, forced to look elsewhere for housing, and some end up on the streets. We see the connection between, between gentrification and colonialism more clearly in places like Hawaii and Puerto Rico, where developers see a, a tropical paradise ready for settlement by wealthier newcomers. It would be nice to think that the settler colonialism was solely a, a phenomenon of the capitalist West, but Stalin's mass deportation of the Crimean Tatars also qualifies, as do China's current settlement projects in Tibet and Xinjiang. Settler colonialism uh, springs from the ethos of domination, seeking to subdue the land and its, and its people to its own projects and designs. It is a refusal to cooperate and work within the limitations required to share the earth with others. It is an extractive attitude toward the commons. The settler is not an immigrant seeking to accommodate themselves to their new home, but a colonizer seeking to conquer the land in their own image. This is why settlers tend to be uh, just as hostile toward new immigrants as toward indigenous peoples, as seen in America's genocidal policies toward its southern border. Whether a group came before or after it doesn't matter, because it's only the settler that truly belongs. The post-war decolonization process manifested as natural liberation movements, but to truly decolonize, we must uh, look uh, beyond the nation-state, which is itself a colonial project. A regime of private property and national borders must give way to one of use of fruits and confederation. This is why the land back movement is not a nationalist program of ethnic cleansing, contrary to the claims of some of the worst people in the world. <coughs> uh, instead, it involves the uh, deconstruction of, of these colonial barriers, so that more cooperative forms of, of land tenure can prevail as they did private colonization. Not that territorial disputes didn't exist back then. They absolutely did. But the colonial mode of conquest was alien to them. It must be overcome in our present age. Private property is based on the right to exclude, to control, and to, and to transfer, whereas usufruct is, is the right to privately use a part of the commons for a given period before returning it, much like a library book. Nation states involve a state's exclusive jurisdiction over a given territory and, and anyone living in it, as well as exclusive access to its resources. Violent border conflicts erupt over uh, who gets to control which population or resource. Confederation, by contrast, is a principle of connectivity in which one group of people join together with another based on mutual interest, with neither dominating and controlling the other. Rather than territorial borders, it operates as a network of connected nodes, Usufruct and confederation are older than private property or, or nation state, or, or empire for that matter. They're granted in the commons, that shared space of all that we inherit and create together. All systems of power and domination are rooted in the plunder of the commons. To decolonize uh, means we must restore the commons to its rightful place. In an age where human rights are cynically invoked by powerful nations only to justify more plunder and conquest, we must ex instead extend our solidarity to all oppressed people based on the right to the commons. Only by working together to restore the commons can we build a world in which many worlds fit and restore the rights and dignity of all who dwell on this planet. 